Today, F.W. de Klerk passed away. He was born in South Africa in 1936 and passed away from cancer on November 11, 2021, age 85. F.W. de Klerk was the last white president of South Africa. He partnered with Nelson Mandela to end apartheid, grant voting rights to all black and colored citizens, and transition to a multiracial democracy. We'll use some of the slides from our videos on Nelson Mandela, first on his youth and civil rights struggles, and then from the video from Prison of the Presidency that tells the story of the transition from apartheid to a multiracial democracy, and we'll consult with Dr. Wikipedia from some additional details about F.W. de Klerk in particular. F.W. de Klerk graduated from law school in South Africa in 1958 and started his own law firm in 1962. Shortly after his alma mater offered him a chair in their law faculty, he was approached by the pro-apartheid National Party to run for a seat in Parliament. And for much of his career, he was a strong supporter of the apartheid system. As you can see from this sign, both in Jim Crow America and in apartheid South Africa, blacks and whites had to be separated. They couldn't even use the same drinking fountain or the same bathrooms. There's discrimination against Africans and the colored or people who are part black and the Indians. Black South Africans could not vote. They owned little of their land and were paid poverty level wages. Life for the black South Africans became much worse in 1948 when the Boer Nationalist Party unexpectedly won the national elections. And these Nationalist Party leaders had publicly sympathized with Nazi Germany in the war. And during the campaign, their motto was, the white man must always remain boss. Apartheid was given moral underpinnings by the Dutch Reformed Church, which suggested that Afrikaners were God's chosen people and blacks were a subservient species. In the Afrikaners' worldview, apartheid and the church went hand in hand. Was South Africa like Jim Crow Mississippi in your worst nightmares? There are both similarities and differences between South Africa and the Deep South. The South Africans were never enslaved, although they were paid starvation wages in the mines and as servants. South Africans always kept their tribal identity, culture, and languages, whereas the children of the slaves in America had little notion of their tribal identity. Under both Jim Crow and apartheid, interracial marriage was considered both illegal and immoral, and segregation was enforced by law. Apartheid South Africa spent per capita, six times more on white education than it did on black education. And this was similar to the disparity in the separate but equal education in the Jim Crow Deep South. One important difference was that South African blacks could be denied the right to assemble, whereas this was never totally lost in the Jim Crow Deep South. Because Nelson Mandela and the ANC, or African National Congress, was legally forbidden to protest the apartheid system, and because the South African apartheid government violently suppressed the protest demonstrations, the ANC started an armed insurrection initially with acts of sabotage to avoid casualties. Soon after Mandela was put in charge of the newly formed military wing of the ANC, he was arrested and tried for treason. And Mandela spent nearly 30 years of his life in a series of South African prisons. During this time, Mandela was the most famous prisoner in the world, Soon after he was incarcerated, the UN General Assembly imposed the first trade sanctions against South Africa, and acts of resistance and sabotage continued. In the years following Mandela's arrest, the black protesters became more radicalized, especially after the Soweto mass protest in 1976. Mandela remembers, these young men were a different breed of prisoner than we had ever seen before. They were brave, hostile, and aggressive. They would not take orders and shouted, Amandla, or Black Power, at every opportunity. Their instinct was to confront rather than cooperate. The authorities did not know how to handle them. This armed insurrection persisted for over a decade after the Soweto riots. The South African government could see no end to these violent protests, which were starting to degenerate into a brutal civil war. The South African leadership started to realize that the government needed to transition out of this nightmare. The beginning of the process started under the end of presidency of P.W. Botha, who resigned due to bad health. This transition was completed under F.W. de Klerk's presidency from 1986 to 1994. One day, the prison guards marched into Mandela's cramped cell in Robbie Prison. 
and told Mandel to pack up his things. He was going to be transferred with the other top ANC leaders. His new home would be the Polesmore Maximum Security Prison in Cape Town. But here, Mandela and the other ANC leaders discover that they have much better accommodations. They had the entire third floor to themselves. They each had their own bathrooms, their own showers, and beds and sheets and towels. And they could feast on three meals a day of meat and vegetables. And they could read many magazines without censors cutting out forbidden news. The chapter in his autobiography over this period of his life, Mandela titles, Talking with the Enemy. Indeed, the ruling National Party was starting to realize that majority rule was inevitable. They were coming under increasing political and financial pressure. New sanctions were imposed by the UN, US, and other countries. More companies closed their operations in South Africa. Banks and investors decreased their holdings in the country. ANC acts of sabotage increased. And protests and bloodshed on both sides kept increasing, and worst of all, the South African football teams were excluded from international competition. The days of apartheid were numbered. Shortly after this, Mandela thought the time had come to make the first step. He told the top prison officials, I want to see the minister in order to raise the question of talks between the government and the ANC. And the official said that he would see if he could arrange a meeting with both of them. And to put Mandela in a good mood, the government even arranged for the warden to give him a surprise tour of the beautiful beaches and charming white neighborhood of Cape Town. And the warden even welcomed Nelson to his house for dinner on occasion. Mandela remembers, it was absolutely riveting to watch the simple activities of people out in the world. Old men sitting in the sun, women doing their shopping, people walking their dogs. It is precisely those mundane activities of life that one misses most in prison. I felt like a curious tourist in a strange and remarkable land. One day, Nelson Mandela learned he'd be transferred to the Victor Verster Minimum Security Prison, where he was given a one-story cottage all to himself. And this cottage had a kitchen and a swimming pool and several nice bedrooms, and Mandela was even assigned an Afrikaner cook, Mr. Swart, so he could adequately entertain his ANC comrades and other guests. Now, Mr. Swart and Nelson became great friends, Mr. Swart had met him when he was a warder from Robben Island. Nelson and Mr. Swart compromised in which language they would use. Mr. Swart would speak to him in English, and Mandela would answer in Afrikaans, so both could practice speaking the language which was their weakest. Nelson would later disarm the, his Boer opponents by speaking to them in fluent Dutch Afrikaans. The Dutch Boers had settled in South Africa several hundred years before, and Mandela was more familiar with the white Afrikaner history better than many Boers. He would very patiently retell the story of his ANC movement, comparing the struggle the blacks experienced resisting apartheid to the struggles of the Boers endured to gain independence from the English. But before a meeting with Botha could be arranged, some preliminary talks were needed. The first issue was that the government insisted the ANC must renounce violence and give up an armed struggle before the government would agree to negotiations. Mandela responded that it is always the oppressor, not the oppressed, who dictates the form of the struggle. If the oppressor uses violence, the oppressed have no alternative but to respond violently. A South African official observed that the National Party had stated repeatedly that it would not negotiate with any organization that advocated violence. Politically, what else could they do? Nelson Mandela simply responded, Gentlemen, it is not my job to resolve your dilemma for you. And the secondary issue was the relationship between the ANC and the Communist Party. Mandela said that the Communist Party did not control the ANC, and that the ANC did not believe in the Communist ideology, but that he would not disavow the assistance the Communist Party had provided over the years. Third issue was whether the rights of the minorities, in particular the white minority, would be guaranteed under majority rule. Mandela's response were that whites were Africans as well as blacks, and that in any future dispensation, the majority would need the minority. We do not want to drive the whites into the sea. And here you see the source of our thumbnail picture. Shortly before he was released, Mandela finally got his meeting with Botha. Mandela was provided a suit and was smuggled into the presidential office, and Botha staged a welcoming walk where they met in the middle of a grand hall, shook hands, had their official picture taken, and then chatted in his office over tea about South African history. Both his health was failing, he would soon resign. F.W. de Klerk would succeed him, 
and Mandela does not speculate, but perhaps the meeting was set up so Botha would be the first one to cross the Rubicon, so that the cleric would not be the first South African president to meet face to face with Nelson Mandela. And unfortunately up to now we've been talking more about Mandela than de Klerk because de Klerk was a secondary figure in this most important part of his life. Now if W. de Klerk had won the leadership of the National Party with a narrow majority and one immediate change to government policy was to permit demonstrations which the security forces had opposed. And de Klerk stated that the choice therefore was between breaking up such an illegal march with all of the attendant risks of violence and negative publicity or of allowing the march to continue subject to conditions that could help to avoid violence and ensure public order. He also pardoned several elderly anti-apartheid activists and legalized both Mandela's ANC party and the Communist Party. The day Mandela was released from prison, the roads were so crowded with singing, dancing, jubilant Africans that his motorcade arrived very late at the Cape Town City Hall for the planned celebrations. Negotiations began to plan for the elections to a national assembly that would write a new constitution and form a new majority government. Now that Mandela was out of prison, the real negotiations were proceeding and the violence escalated. Mandela had to walk the fine line between firmness and compromise to bring the country to the ballot box, and F.W. de Klerk also had to walk the fine line to maintain the confidence of his white electorate, who were very wary of ending apartheid. And members of a far-right fringe group had urged armed rebellion. It was nipped in the bud because the party leader was a military veteran, and he just was unwilling to wage war against the government. After some debate, and with Mandela's urging, the ANC declared it would suspend its armed struggle, with the understanding that armed struggle could resume if the government showed bad faith. And there was tension between the ANC and the ruling National Party. Mandela and the ANC thought the government was trying to negotiate a power-sharing arrangement that was little more than a watered-down apartheid. But the ANC realized they could not effectively govern if the current civil servants running the government fled after the elections, and in the end they agreed for the first five years that every major party would be represented in the cabinet, and after that there would be simple majority rule. The National Party lost an important by-election by a more right-wing party, so de Klerk scheduled a referendum so the white people of South Africa could, could vote on whether they supported the reform process that would lead to a new constitution through negotiation and the vote was 69% in favor, giving de Klerk a great political victory. The presidential campaign began. The ANC had an ambitious platform, which was only partially fulfilled upon election, which included creating jobs through public works, building a million new homes with electricity and flush toilets, what a goal, to extend primary health care and public education for all, and to redistribute land through a land claims court, and to pass a VAT tax on basic foodstuffs. Often Mandela told crowds, don't expect to be driving a Mercedes the day after election or be swimming in your own backyard swimming pool. Life will not change dramatically, except your self-esteem will increase and you will become a citizen in your own land. You must have patience. You might have to wait five years for results to show. The ANC won the election with 63% of the vote. Mandela was happy that the ANC did not gain the two-thirds needed to draft the Constitution without input from other parties. He did not want an ANC Constitution, he wanted a South African Constitution. In the closing pages of his autobiography, Mandela shares some interesting thoughts. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin, or his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart. Even in the grimmest times in prison, when my comrades and I were pushed to their limits, I would see a glimmer of humanity in one of the guards, perhaps just for a second, but it was enough to reassure me and keep me going. Man's goodness is a flame that can be hidden, but never extinguished. When Mandela was elected president, F.W. de Klerk was elected deputy president under the transition government. There are tensions both between him and Mandela and between de Klerk and the more conservative elements in his party who were not in favor of ending apartheid. Tensions rose until F.W. de Klerk pulled his party out of the coalition government a few years early. And after his retirement, de Klerk founded a pro-peace foundation and participated in international conferences promoting democracy. Although de Klerk cooperated and supported the Truth and Reconciliation Commission set up to probe the abuses of the apartheid years, 
there was also tension between him and Mandela and the commission members. Now about Nelson Mandela, F.W. de Klerk says, when Mandela goes, it will be a moment when all South Africans put away their political differences. We'll take hands and we'll together honor maybe the biggest known South African that has ever lived. And on the death of Mandela in 2013, de Klerk said, he was a great unifier and a very, very special man in this regard beyond everything else he did. His emphasis on reconciliation was his biggest legacy. And now we'll talk about the source we used for this video. Nelson Mandela's The Long Walk to Freedom is a captivating autobiography that covers the birth of the modern South African nation and has fascinating history on the transition from tribal South Africa to a modern nation, from colonialism under England to independence, from relative freedom to the oppressions of the apartheid system, and finally Nelson Mandela's personal transition from prison to the presidency. And The Great Courses also has an excellent series of lectures on the history of Africa that include some lectures on South Africa. And if you're interested, you can purchase affordable used copies of a biography and autobiography of F.W. de Klerk. Uh, currently, they're out of print. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission, and please consider becoming a patron of our channel, and please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.